beating the risk factors in preventing or delaying diabetes. Joining us for this week's Your Health segment is Dr. Nanette Steinle, Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and endocrinologist at the University of Maryland Diabetes and Endocrinology Center, also Interim Chief of the Endocrine Section at the Baltimore VA. Doctor, thank you for being with us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Let's start at the beginning with diabetes and the difference between type 1 and type 2. Sure. In general, we think about the two broad classifications of diabetes. Type 1 typically occurs in childhood, but not always, and is a, dis is a disorder involving lack of insulin production. In type 2 diabetes, usually we see this happening more often in adults, although with the problem of obesity, children are also being more affected with type 2 diabetes. And this is a problem where initially there's overproduction of insulin or insulin resistance, followed then by reduced amounts of insulin, which causes the blood sugar to become elevated. How big a role does um, weight and obesity play in the development of type 2? We believe that obesity and weight are major factors in the development of type 2 diabetes. And actually, the diabetes prevention study that we're going to talk about in a little bit showed that individuals who are successful with losing weight, for each approximately two pounds of weight loss, the reduction of diabetes risk is about 15 percent. So that makes a, a major category of illness suffered by many, many Americans somewhat preventable. We do believe that it is uh, somewhat preventable. There was a large randomized prospective trial that was conducted that showed that individuals who ate a healthy diet, primarily low calorie, healthy fats, and exercised, and that wasn't high intensity exercise, walking 150 minutes or about 30 minutes a day, 150 minutes a week, 30 minutes a day, if they lost about 7% of their excess uh, body weight, their reduction for diabetes type 2 was about 60%. Is there a, a tipping point where you can be a little bit heavy, but if your body mass index is over a certain number, then then the risk really jumps? Or, or is, it, is it more gradual? It seems to probably be more gradual, um, that the the behaviors, the lifestyle that contribute to obesity, inactivity, overeating are probably cumulative. And then as an individual gains weight and continues inactive behaviors, overeating, the risk for diabetes gradually increases. All right, well, let's focus in on the diet stuff a little bit. And before you were a medical doctor, you were a nutritionist. Correct. And you've brought a cup full of cereal with you, which we appreciate. Thank you for that. What, what's the point? And that looks like a, a one cup measure you have. It is. So the, the, the point is that when we promote healthy eating behaviors, one thing that's important are the types of foods that we choose. And the, the data would suggest that the healthy foods includes those that are high in fiber, and that would include whole grains, plant-based diet uh, versus an animal-based diet. But in addition to that, portion control. So it's important to read the labels on, on foods and pay attention to what it says one serving size. And for this particular cereal, which is a whole grain oat cereal, one serving size is one cup. So here we have a small bowl. And just so the viewers can see that one cup fills about half of the bowl. And so if if someone is just filling the bowl, they may be having two serving sizes. And so it's easy to have extra calories uh, coming in uh, to the body without really being aware that, oh, maybe this is a little bit more than I should be eating. Because none of us measure it that way. But it's helpful to be able to look at it and see that that's actually the, the serving size when you Correct. look at the calories on the box. Correct. So in this case, one could perhaps use the same bowl each time and say, okay, I know that half of this bowl is one serving size and then fill the bowl each time rather than having to measure it. The biggest problem, of course, is, is uh, the second bowl and the, the bowl right. after that. And once you get going, especially with, with something appetizing and maybe with a little sugar on it, it's hard to stop. 
sometimes it is. And again, um, being disciplined and um, finding other activities rather than sometimes, you know, we eat for entertainment rather than for nutrition. And once we've had what we know to be the food that we need, we can go and take a walk rather than having a second bowl of cereal. What's the, what's the role for genetics in, in type 2 diabetes? Well, clearly there is a role for genetics, and studies have shown that specific genetic mutations increase the risk for type 2 di- <clears throat> excuse me, diabetes. That's why we have the glass of water, and we won't even measure it. <laughs> Certain... Uh, mutations in genes increase the risk for diabetes. The good news is that in this very large randomized trial that I mentioned earlier called the Diabetes Prevention Project, blood was taken. And when the investigators then went back and performed studies looking at whether or not the participants in the diabetes prevention trial carried these variants, these gene risks, even the people who had the genetic risks that engaged in healthy lifestyle, their diabetes, chance of diabetes was reduced. So if, if somebody's from a family where there are a lot of cases of diabetes and you suspect that it's, it's in the genes and, and you may feel a little like it's destiny, it's not necessarily? That's correct. The good news is that being active, healthy diet, can still reduce the chances of diabetes in a person who's at risk genetically. Let me remind our viewers, if you have a question about diabetes, you can give us a call. We'll have the number up on the screen. You can also tweet your questions. Our Twitter address is at MPT News. One of the really interesting things is what happens with bariatric surgery. When somebody has the stomach stapling or or the variants of that for obesity and they lose weight, what, what happens to their diabetes, and, and, and how, how likely is that to change? Often, very soon after the bariatric surgical procedure is completed, even before significant weight loss has occurred, we see improvements in glucose homeostasis. And we're really trying to understand what that may be about. It could be that the hormones that help regulate insulin and blood sugar are impacted by the surgery. It could be that certainly postoperatively, the person who had surgery is eating, you know, consuming much less food during that time. And so we're still really trying to understand, but how, what the mechanisms are. But we, in most people, in many people, the surgery has been shown to help either uh, remit the diabetes or improve it greatly. Is there anything on the medication front, certainly medications for diabetes, but in terms of diabetes prevention, uh, somebody who's maybe beginning to show symptoms, is there anything? The diabetes prevention trial that I mentioned earlier did contain two arms with medications. One was stopped, uh, one arm was stopped because the medication was withdrawn from the market. But the other arm continued, and the medication that was used is metformin, which is a drug that is generic, inexpensive, widely available, and used to treat type 2 diabetes. And metformin was uh, beneficial. The extent of reduction of risk was not as dramatic. It was about 30 percent compared to approximately 60 percent for for diet and exercise. But there is benefit uh, to metformin and likely some other medications that we have that improve insulin sensitivity. And diet and exercise are, are free and you look better as, as well. Let's, uh, let's take a phone call. Washington, D.C. This is Linda. Linda, thanks for the call. Go ahead. Yeah, um, thanks for taking my call. I was you bet. talking about now, um, is developing diabetes part of the aging process? Interesting. Thank you very much. So the studies do show that as we age, our chances or our risk for diabetes does increase. And so I would answer yes to the viewer's question that it, it, it is part of the aging process. The, the cells that produce insulin become, uh, some, as part of the aging process, uh, less uh, effective. And um, 
The interesting thing is, though, in the diabetes prevention trial, it was the older people who benefited the most from diet and exercise. Okay, and when you talked earlier about diet and exercise, and on the exercise side, you talked about walking. Does it have to be any more strenuous than that, or, or does a good walk on a regular basis do it? A good walk, 30 minutes a day, five days a week, is what's been shown to be helpful. So it's, as you said, not expensive, no memberships required, uh, as long as there's a safe place to walk. And uh, many people will walk indoors for at a local shopping mall, for example, if it's too hot or too cold. And a good pair of, of walking shoes is really all that's required. Uh, Prince William County, Virginia. This is John. John, thanks for the call. Go ahead. Yes, I'm a physician in, in Manassas, Virginia. Yes, sir. And, and I developed the influenza. And what happened was I was uh, really sick and I was pushing fluids. And I was drinking some soda. Well, then my vision blurred and I developed diabetes, uh, the type 2 diabetes. So I wonder, you know, we know that after influenza, many people develop Parkinson's disease. I wonder if it's common for people to develop diabetes after having a bout of influenza. I think the influenza virus attacks the pancreas. Interesting. Thank you for the phone call. Yes. So there are data that suggest that viral illnesses may precede the onset of actually both type 1 um, and perhaps type 2 diabetes. The inflammatory process that um, occurs during an, an acute illness is thought to be active uh, or part of the process uh, that's involved in the development of, of diabetes. Now, what's pre-diabetes? The term pre-diabetes is applied when the blood sugar is a little bit higher than normal, but not quite to the level where we would draw the line and say, okay, this is, di this is diabetes. And the studies, again, show that pre-diabetes in terms of risk factors for cardiovascular disease, um, in the risk for cardiovascular disease is increased in prediabetes as it is in persons with diabetes. So we care very much about the prediabetes situation. Let's take another call from Washington. This is Bruce. Bruce, thanks for calling. Go ahead. Uh, I want to know is diabetes hereditary in my family. I'm, you know, think I'm, I'm metformin. I think I'm on metformin. I want to know what can I do to uh, my chances of. Uh, Control of my diabetes. Yes, sir. I didn't have, have surgery too. I'm sorry. What what sort of surgery? I had surgical surgery. They had to move two discs out my back. Oh my. The okay. C5 and C3. Sir, thank you for the call. Best of luck, and and that's basically what you're talking about here. Family history, how to prevent it. Right. I'm not sure if the caller said that he has diabetes or he's concerned about reducing his risk for diabetes. That's what I heard with the family history of it. So if the situation is a person with a strong family history of diabetes, um, eating a healthy diet, plant-based, low-fat, energy balanced, has been shown to reduce the risk. So I would encourage this uh, caller to be active. Now, he had surgery um, on the disc in his back of their cervical that would affect his arms. Um, you know, if he can still walk, take a good walk, Consider maybe a stationary bicycle if he's concerned about, you know, being outdoors, um, but being active and... and let, let me ask this. Who, who does he see or, or someone in a similar situation? Uh, not, not a diabetes patient at this point, we don't think, concerned about it. Family physician or at what point do you see a specialist? What I would suggest if... If the viewers have access to the internet, there are many places where one can get good information. American Diabetes Association, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, National Institutes of Health, National Institutes of Diabetes and Kidney Diseases, or NIDDK, um, the American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, all have very good information on their websites about diabetes prevention. Certainly, a family a physician uh, could also be someone to engage. There are certified diabetes educators that would know in, in the community that would know about diabetes prevention as well. 
Uh, let's go to Cecil County. This is Vicki. Vicki, thanks for the call. Go ahead. Yes, I'm calling about uh, reading in professional papers and association between the development of diabetes with the medication Lipitor. Thank you very much. Now, Lipitor is a cholesterol drug? Lipitor is a cholesterol-lowering medication in the family that we call statins. And there has been a fair amount of question in the scientific community about this association that shows that perhaps individuals who take a statin may be at increased risk uh, for type 2 diabetes. And we wouldn't say at this point that there's a cause and effect, but there is an association. And it seems, though, that the individuals who are more at risk for developing diabetes are also those individuals who have higher cholesterol. So is it something metabolic or is it the drug? We haven't really sorted that out yet. Before we go, we've been talking about diabetes for a while, and, and people might be wondering about symptoms. I mean, how do you know that you ought to be concerned, and, and, and is a blood test still the, the way to diagnose it? The blood test is still the way to diagnose diabetes. Some people never have symptoms, and that's one of the concerns. Practically... Um, one in three Americans who are at risk, one of those persons will have diabetes and not know it. So we do recommend routine, right now we recommend routine screening after the age of 40. So your primary doctor could do a, a fasting blood test to, to check for diabetes. Very good. Dr. Nanette Steinle of the University of Maryland School of Medicine, University of Maryland Medical Center, VA Medical Center in Baltimore. Thank you for making time for us. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.